I'm Dr. Michael Latola. She's Rihanna. I'm Megan Strong. She is Megan Strong. Topic number one on today's show, Megan, better as a redhead or better as a blonde? Take our online poll. And it was an accident, by the way. And then in the news, we find out that Fred Flintstone he really was a dentist. And in our case of the week, I'm going to give you our restorative breakdown for the six months of 2015 so far. We'll take a look back to 2007 and see how the restorative landscape has changed. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 12 squared of Chairside Live. Lucille Ball! Rude. <laughs> what are... I've Megan. had a rough couple days here. Wow. I've had a rough couple days. Wow. First of all... May I remind the viewers of the gorgeous blonde mm. that you've seen before for years uh, on this show before. And yeah. uh, I'm noticing it's a slightly different shade now. It is. Listen. So, my normal hairdresser, who I love, right. um, she is on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So, I got a wild hair... See what Super I did cuts. There? See mm -hmm. what I did oh there? yeah. No, I, did. Okay. I went to somebody else, mm -hmm. and um, I was trying to go for like this color they call bronze. It's um, like brown with blonde and whatever. First day, I was done on Saturday. Uh, first day, fantastic, great, looked awesome. Second day, ah, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And then now, fast forward to here, and my hair is the color of a penny. Right. So, um, it's, what was the name of the color? It was supposed to be bronze. Bronze. Yeah, and it does. See, because it kind of looks bronze. You should have done. Try make a uh, brown. Yeah, <laughs> that's a combination. I should have done of anything but what I did. And brown. So I have an appointment tomorrow to get it cut up. No, fixed. Shaved. shaved. No, fixed. Um, to add. Come on. Right. Uh -huh, Come yeah. on. Sure. So I've for got charity. that working for me, and then today. Can you believe it for the first time in uh, my 12 years of driving, which I was made fun of for, um, because apparently that's not long enough to even talk about. So, but in my 12 years of driving, I've never run out of gas, ever, okay, because, <laughs> why are you laughing? You're so proud. It just reminds me of Chris Rock saying, I take care of my kids. It's like, well, you're, so, you're supposed to, you're not supposed to run out of gas. Okay, well, anyways, I haven't ever ran out of gas. I've never been right. in that situation, and today, driving into work, it happened. And uh, luckily, it wasn't on the busy street, which our lab is on. Um, but it was, I felt it happening, which I'd never felt right. before. So I'm like, what is this? And I was turning into a parking lot right before our office, and um, it stopped. I'm glad you're here completely. and safe. And I know you've been driving for 12 years, Maria Andretti. But 40 years ago, um, we didn't have, do you have a little light that comes on in your car and tells you, Fuel's getting low? Of course I do. <laughs> in the old days, that didn't happen. You just never knew how much. Oh, so no. running out of gas actually was more of a reality like in these you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But you probably just got busy. You were running late. You didn't want to stop by the gas station. I'm going to yes. help you with some excuses here. Thank you. And I honestly, I saw that it, the light came on. But I thought, oh, I've got at least you know another 15 miles in there. Right. I didn't. Right. I didn't. It was like 1.5 miles. So my hair is ridiculous. My car is out of gas. Our pet's heads are falling off. And. Name that movie. And I don't know. Well, you should. I it's don't. Dumb and Dumber. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. Daryl would have got that. Um, you also had one of the things that causes me to have a panic attack. You walked in here and your phone was charged to 7%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I started sweating I know, it's in bad. places I didn't know. I had sweat glands, That's and fortunately gross. somebody charged it for you. So He did. I really, and a couple um, of the people on the production team here helped push my car. Oh, Shout out to Mo sweet. and Andrew. Way to yeah. go, Mo and Andrew. Right. So eating all that barbecue for two weeks, that's not responsible for the hair change color. Rude. Rude. Well, viewers, let us know. I want to hear. No, they, they don't need Text to let us know. Text one to, I don't know, 4424 or some random it's number if you like it's Megan better good. as a brown or a blonde or whatever she said. Or if you like her better as a blonde, the old uh, text two to Chairside Live. Okay, I don't know. talk Find about the case of the week. Let's all go. All right. Well, case of the week this week, it's all me talking. Actually, there's a picture of Megan in What's the case you? of the week, too. It's uh, the 2015 restorative update. Every year, I like to sit down and look at what's happened in the laboratory and what dentists are prescribing. Because as a lab, we can try to sell dentists anything, but the rubber hits the road to see what dentists have prescribed. So we're going to go back to 2007, all the way to the six months into 2015, and look what dentists are prescribing. That's you guys. Let's take a look at that now.
On this week's Case of the Week, I wanted to give you a restorative update. I know it looks like I'm just showing you a picture of uh, Megan and I. In fact, if you didn't know better, we look like uh, either... Uh, I don't know if we look like a married couple here. Actually, we look like a married couple that's super angry at each other, giving each other fake smiles. Um, I wanted to give you a restorative update. We kind of do this once a year on the show, and it's just interesting to kind of see how um, our business evolves. And again, keep in mind that uh, here at Glidewell, we work with dentists in all 50 states. Uh, California is our biggest state, Texas number two, New York number three, New Jersey number four, Michigan number five. So it's not just the West Coast, not just the East Coast. It's spread all across the United States. So when you look at the types of restorations we do, it's fairly well representative of what the dentists of America are doing. And so we're going to look at a retrospective that goes back uh, eight years, starting in 2007. And first thing we're going to look at as a category is PFMs. And you can see the trend here. Uh, if you go back to 2007, uh, about 65% of the crowns that we made here were PFMs. In fact, the graph gets too big, but if you go back 10 more years to 1997, it's up about 74, 76%. And so it had slowly kind of been coming down. And you can see going from 2007 to 2008, it goes from 65% down to about 62%. And then in 2009, we see a little more of a drop. So it gets below 60% to the first time to 57%. And then in 2010, boom, drops all the way to 45%. And then in 2011, down to about 31%. 2012, 22%. Now it's dropping uh, precipitously. 2013, 18% of crowns and bridges were PFM. Uh, 2014, down to about 12%. And now in 2015, year to date, it's at 10.5%. So where's it going to be in 2016? I think it's pretty clear that for the first time ever, we're going to see that less than 10% of the crowns and bridges that we make here at the lab are, in fact, going to be porcelain fused to metal. So what happened to the PFM? You know, has the quality in the PFMs dropped from 2007 to now? Uh, did the ADA or the CDC or the FDA come out with a warning statement that PFMs cause, uh, say, premature hair loss, for example, or a double chin or ED? These are just random things I'm throwing out. No, in fact, the PFMs here were actually way better than they were 20 years ago when PFMs were, you know, 90% of the crowns made and the other 10% were cast gold. The porcelains on PFMs are actually kinder to opposing teeth than they were 20 years ago as well. Nothing happened to the PFM. It didn't change at all. What changed was the rise of the all ceramics. Um, there's a lecture that I'm currently giving called The Monolithic Revolution, and the reason I titled it that is because the monolithic restorations, the first one that was launched in 2007 and the second one that was launched in 2009, are the reason for the rapid decline of the PFM. So if you look at this 10.5% of restorations that we do that are still PFMs, uh, a full 65% of this 10.5% are bridges. And so the majority of the PFMs that we do today are bridges, and that's still what I use PFMs for. I haven't done a single unit PFM since 2009. I haven't had a need for a single unit PFM since 2009. But PFM bridges, I definitely still have need for, because the all ceramic bridges that we have today, which should be really strong, aren't still break a little more often than PFM bridges do. So let's scoot this over and we'll look at the all ceramic category. And uh, if we go back to 2007, you can see it's about 22% of the restorations that we were doing. So in 2007, it was still a PFM world. It was mainly PFMs being done with a few all ceramics. Uh, this was the year, 2007, that Emax was introduced. And so these numbers began to climb a little quicker than they had in the past. 2008, we get up to uh, oh, about 27%. 2009, it hops up to about 32%. This is the year that Bruxer was introduced. So Emacs introduced in 2007, uh, Bruxer Solid Zirconia introduced in 2009, and boom, that's where you get that really big bump going to 2010, up to 48%, and then another huge one in 2011, up to 65%, and then another big one up to 75%. Uh, and then as it moves on, uh, we get to uh, 2011, 2012, we get up to 82%, and then finally in 2015, uh, where we are now year to date, 86.8% of the restorations of the crowns and bridges that we're making today uh, in the laboratory. And again, we're averaging over 100,000 crowns and bridges per month. 
86.8% of that all ceramic. So it's mind boggling to me as a dentist who's been a dentist for 27 years to see this because all ceramics were always these you know, little niche products that we used for veneers on anterior teeth when we didn't need a lot of strength, but we did need aesthetics and we knew we had to bond them into place, which was gonna be a pain in the butt, but we had to do it because the materials weren't very strong. And to see this rise, to see it dominate at, at the expense of the PFM, has been amazing and it took two amazing materials to do that uh, emax lithium disilicate which in 2007 was released as a monolithic material keep in mind emax had two previous incarnations the first one was empress 2 released around you know 1996 97 that was a bilayered material lithium disilicate framework with a ceramic on the outside of it that kind of quietly went away. It was re-released as IPS Eris, which was a lithium disilicate framework with porcelain on the outside of it. Same kind of thing. There was debonding issues uh, between the ceramic and the lithium disilicate. And the genius move was when it was released in 2007 uh, as a monolithic material where the whole thing was made out of lithium disilicate. And Dennis instantly knew this was a different, pro a different product uh, that looked just as good, if not better, didn't need to be prepped as much. And then in 2009, uh, kind of based on the same concept of take the porcelain off the lithium disilicate and make the whole crown out of it, uh, we introduced Bruxer, the concept being take the porcelain off the porcelain fused zirconia crown and build the whole crown out of zirconia. And these two monolithic materials, they're solid materials with no porcelain on them whatsoever, are what really revolutionized uh, the lab industry and took the PFM from our, our steady stalwart crown that made up the bulk of what we've done in dentistry since, say, 1959, all of a sudden down to almost being on the endangered species list. You know, we're going to get to a point here where it hits around 5% or, or 6%, I think, as this really kind of starts to bottom out because these monolithic restorations, in my mind, are always superior because there's no outside layer of porcelain to chip or break off of here, and we don't have to reduce as much. You know, for a PFM, we have always asked, so, and so has every lab and all the ceramic manufacturers, have asked for two millimeters of occlusal reduction, ideally 1.5 minimum. Now we look at a material like Emax, it's 1.5 millimeters of reduction, ideally one millimeter minimum, or we look in 2009 at solid zirconia, which is ideally one millimeter of reduction, 0 0.6 minimum. And we can see these monolithic restorations are much more conservative in their preparation requirements than these bilayered restorations. So it's not just PFMs, it's also lava crowns and Procera. Anytime you fuse porcelain to some underlying substructure, whether it be metal, zirconia, or even lithium disilicate back in the day or alumina, um, you're gonna need to reduce more tooth and make room for both of those layers. So this really is a story about the rise of the monoliths, which sounds like some crazy sci-fi movie, but it's these monolithic restorations that dentists have started to rely on. The interesting thing is that our fracture rate for zirconia is the lowest for any product we've ever had in the lab with the exception of cast gold, because that of course doesn't break. And Emax does very well too. And it's both of these monolithic materials will outperform these bilayered materials. As we go to full cast gold, poor full cast gold, you know, it, it's not like it was super popular back in 2007. It started off under 10%, but now it's down to 2.3%. Gold hitting $1,800 an ounce didn't help. Uh, incre increased aesthetic awareness on the part of the patient hasn't helped. Uh, I have a very hard time finding uh, women, for example, or even most men here in California that will allow me to put full cast gold uh, into their mouth. And then lastly, we have composites. These used to exist uh, kind of as a cheaper crown. Dennis kind of wanted something that was cheaper than a PFM or an all ceramic crown. Uh, would in fact maybe order a composite crown or maybe inlays and onlays. But today with the ability to do bulk fill composites chair side on almost any class two preparation, lab fabricated composites are essentially a dead category. And unfortunately, you'd almost have to call full cast uh, a dead category too, which is unfortunate since it is the best restorative material we've ever had in dentistry. It's hard, it, it hurts my heart to see it this low, but the reality is for with solid zirconia, for example, on molars, we can do almost everything we can do with cast gold. And even in cases where it doesn't look like a dead ringer for a tooth or it doesn't look as good as Emax, every patient will tell you 
that even a, a solid zirconia crown that doesn't look like a natural tooth looks a heck of a lot better than flashy gold sitting in their mouth. So it's hard to create value for this uh, for a patient. So I wanted to give you this uh, update now that we're midway through uh, 2015. We're, we're six months through here and show you that this amazing trend just continues where the bilayered restorations, the most popular of which is the PFM, uh, is now down at 10.5% for our crowns and bridges. And the amazing rise of the monoliths, this very first chart is when Emacs again was released and here was the release of Bruxer. Almost 90% of the crowns that we're now making. And I realized that because of who we are, because we're Glidewell and we were you know, obviously so involved with introducing Bruxer, that these numbers are probably higher than they are at other laboratories if you were to look at smaller laboratories across the US. Um, but considering how many labs are getting involved with CAD CAM design and milling restorations, it certainly seems that the rest of the lab industry is going to follow these numbers as well. And being able to put, you know, solid zirconia on molars, being able to put Emax on anterior teeth or Bruxer anterior now on anterior teeth, there's no reason to think that this all ceramic category is going to continue to dominate. And again, I see the one place where the PFMs uh, are going to continue to have some relevance is going to be with bridges. So as this number drops down, it's going to be because less single unit PFMs are done. But I can see this bottoming out around 7% because if you're still going to do a six unit bridge or an eight unit bridge, any kind of big bridge like that, that's asking a lot of solid zirconia. If you're going to try to do it out of that, my preference is still do it out of PFM because we can make that metal framework so much smaller than we can with zirconia. So I don't think PFMs will ever die completely. We might be able to even reinvent them and find a stronger veneering material to put on the outside of it and get some better strength results. But I think it's clear monolithics, if we're able to use them in a particular clinical situation, are always going to be preferable than a bilayered restoration because they allow us to be uh, more conservative. And since they don't have a metal substructure that we have to opaque out, they're going to be more aesthetic as well. Thank you for that, Dr. D. You're welcome, Christina Hendricks. Oh my gosh. Good man, man reference. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's Viewer Mail comes to us from Dr. Peter Bales, and he writes in and says, Dear Dr. D, I watched the last episode of Chairside Live, and I have a question regarding bonding zirconia. Is there any reason not to use Parkell bonding products with zirconia? I'm thinking of Secure and C&B Metabond. Thanks for the info. Great question, Peter. And let me start by saying that Secure, the self-adhesive resin cement from Parkell, is one of my three favorite names in the dental industry. Uh, the first one is Alginot, which sounds like an 80s Saturday Night Live joke, but Alginot is the alginate replacement material from Kerr. My second favorite name is our very own Bruxer, B-R-U-X-Z-I-R, that uh, Jim Shuck here at the lab thought of, another fantastic dental name. And the third one is Secure from Parkell, and they capitalized the S-E at the beginning of the word Secure so that you know it's self-etching, so it's self-etch cure, Secure, letting you know it's a self-adhesive resin cement. So well done, Parkell, in the marketing department, whoever came up with that name, that's one Another one that I wish I would have thought of. So you can use Secure as a self-adhesive resin cement. Or the other one you mentioned, the other Parkell product, CNB Metabond, the first kind of super cement that I remember hearing about in dentistry from Dr. Gordon Christensen. Both of these are resin-based cements, and so bonding them to the tooth is simple and straightforward. The tricky part is, once again, when we want them or ask them to bond to solid zirconia oxide. And so like most other resin-containing cements, we're going to need to make sure that we decontaminate the inside of the zirconia crown, either with sandblasting with 50 micron aluminous oxide particles for like 30 seconds, or you can use the IvoClean product from IvoClar. Just put a couple drops in there for about 20 seconds, stir it around with a micro brush, or you can just leave it alone, actually. I'm just a little fidgety. And then rinse it out after 20 seconds and dry it off. Either of those, the sandblasting or the IvoClean, will decontaminate it. And then we're going to want to use a zirconia primer. So you could use something like, well, anything that has an MDP monomer in it. So even things like, you know, OptiBond, but certainly Z Prime Plus would be the most common one from Bisco. Monobond Plus uh, from Ivaclar also is a zirconia primer. And we put that zirconia primer in the Bruxer crown, leave it in for 20 seconds, air evaporate uh, any solvents and thin it. And then that will bond to either your secure self-adhesive resin cement 
or the CNB Metabon. So both of those products will work just great with zirconia. You just have to take the same caution that you would with any resin containing cement. And that is decontaminating the zirconia and placing a zirconia primer, especially on preps that are short or over tapered. And by short, I mean anything less than say three millimeters from the occlusal surface to the uh, margin of the crown. And by over tapered, you know, we were always taught in a Schillingberg textbook, eight to 10 degrees of convergence, but in all reality here at the lab, we see 15 to 20 all the time. So anything beyond say 20 degrees or a short prep, that's a low retentive prep and you definitely wanna make sure you decontaminate and use the zirconia primer. If you've got a four millimeter long prep where the walls are at six to eight degrees, it really doesn't matter if you decontaminate. You can just use either Secure or CNB Metabon and that zirconia crown will go nowhere. Well, what should we, I wish we had some cement to give uh, to give Peter, but we don't, but we have the next best thing because we know he's doing zirconia and that is a Bruxer adjustment and polishing kit. Uh, so thank you very much. And what do you have for him, Molly Ringwald? The jokes about the red hair. Um, I've got a lovely picture where we look like we're adoringly gazing into each other's eyes for whatever reason. That looks familiar. I think I saw that in the case of the week. And now, it was made famous in the case of the week because I had to cover up the graphs. I filmed that while you weren't here, and okay. I used that picture to cover up the graphs. It was made famous in that nearly 20 minutes ago. See? And now Peter's getting it. We'll sign it for him and pass it along. Fresh out of the toaster, Evan. Well done, Peter. Do we have any news, Jessica we, Rabbit? We do. It's so bad. A Minnesota dental office recently fell victim to two cyber attacks in just one week. Their bank accounts weren't robbed. The hackers demanded they pay a cyber ransom after blocking the office's access to its own patient database. They first demanded $1,000, then $600 four days later. The hack shut the practice down. They couldn't even take x-rays or verify pa patients' information. The owner said he traded in his paper filing system for a $70,000 electronic one to comply with the state mandate. Out of the 600 dental offices using this specific software system nationwide, around 20 have become victim to this type of crime in the last year. As for now, the doctor is out $1,600, while his office is working with a software provider to resolve the issue and prevent future attacks. Well, this is the kind of thing that I think is going to become all too common. Um, not only, you know, I had my identity hacked. Uh, it's been three or four weeks ago, and uh, I had 12 credit cards open in my name. And I'm sure you, as a celebrity, uh, Lindsay Lohan, are even more uh, vulnerable to that than I might be. And so they just started doing it and doing it and start hacking it. And pretty much everybody you talk to has had a credit card violation of some sort. Uh, I just saw that uh, Ashley Madison, the cheating, the married cheating website, has been hacked into and 37 million people uh, are at risk there. Uh, here at the lab, we have Anthem Blue Cross Healthcare, and that's what, uh, that's what Equifax thinks was the way that they got all my information and then opened up all the different credit cards, some really lame ones like uh, Kohl's and JCPenney's that I hope take off my record because it just doesn't look good. <laughs> and then Abercrombie & Fitch and Restoration Hardware, it's I'm like okay aim, with. Right, aim a little bit higher. I know. At least. Come on, people. Don't make it. It's one thing to steal my identity, but if you're make going to do that, it. don't leave my remaining identity look awful. You know, with, with, with Kohl's and J.C. Penney's and Dick's Sporting Goods. It's like, <laughs> who needs credit cards at these places? Right. And you know what's interesting? It's like, and maybe this is a ridiculous thought, but I'm thinking like $1,600, that's it? Right. If you're going to go through the trouble of hacking a system and holding someone for a cyber ransom, like, right. wouldn't you try to get at least more than $1,000 one time and then 600 bucks another? Right. Wouldn't you try to at least get... One million dollars. <laughs> and that was like, what, 96 when that movie came out? Right, and I can't believe that you, um, didn't, you just jumped right over the opportunity there to make another redhead joke. Right when we were talking about that. Seth Green, hello. Oh, well, I didn't want to switch genders. I feel like I'm insulting you enough with, with just the red hair jokes. Anyways, yeah, so that's that. So, yeah, it's unfortunate, and I think that as we move more and more into this digital space, while it does offer incredible benefits, right. um, you know, if this is just going to happen. I agree. Anything else? Julianne yeah. Moore? Okay. Researchers have found the earliest known evidence that humans treated dental cavities. The team examined a roughly 14,000-year-old molar and found strange striations and chipping on the enamel of a partially rotten tooth. 
They tested the marks and figured they were made by pointed stone tools that were used to probe and scrape away at the decayed area. The fact that the chipped area is worn out confirmed that the scratches were made while the person was still alive. The skeleton is from a 25-year-old and was found in northern Italy in 1988. Scientists have studied the specimen for decades without realizing that the hole in the man's molar might be more than just a bad cavity. The findings also tell us about the diets of our ancestors and how we may have been eating more carbohydrates long before the arrival of agriculture. Well, Meredith, now come on, you like you love the I office. I love the office. I know, I know, She's right. actually a hilarious character. Right, and she is a hussy with loose morals, but still. Um, all right, so here's that tooth. Yes. That actually is a decent looking prep if you're using like a... A, a chisel and a hammer to try to hit right. that into that. That looks better than a lot of the preps I did in uh, in dental school and is kind of amazing. And I've been reading how uh, it's funny to see the wear facets and on the tooth in front of it, too. We used to have a really hard diet, and uh, so we were wearing our teeth down a little bit more, and he's got a nice broad contact between mm -hmm. those two molars. There's a lot to like uh, about that tooth besides the hole in it. They probably didn't have a really good filling material, but because of global warming, there is now glaciers that are melting, you know, in Europe, and they're finding corpses. They just found a couple World War I bodies, two people, like, huddled together because of the uh, glacier retreating yeah. and it melting. They're finding all these preserved um, specimens that they hadn't seen before and they would have never found otherwise. So I think we're going to see more stuff like this, and it's probably going to push back uh, the date uh, of the earliest dentistry. But as far as prepping just by hammering something, that's pretty good looking. Yeah, it's a, it's I have to nice say, prep. I am impressed. Look how smooth it is. They did not, GV Black hadn't been born yet, so they didn't do what's called extension for prevention by going into those grooves where there's a little more decay there. But for uh, Stone Age, well, not Stone Age, but for Bronze Age or Bronze Age, too, too <laughs> soon. It's, uh, it's actually pretty soon. good uh, for that dentistry. Yes. So um, thank you for that. Sorry for all the jokes. It's and okay. uh, we look forward to, I know I speak for all the audience when I say we look forward to seeing uh, what wacky hair color you have when you show up next week hopefully it'll be back to normal maybe even in a new and improved version of my blonde all right but this is done we'll see we will wait with bated breath hopefully we'll get a few emails telling us what color uh, oh, people gosh. like the most so on behalf of myself uh, megan james kwasniewski the polish non-union equivalent of steven spielberg and everybody here at the lab i want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry we'll see you next time Thank you, Elmo. And that's a great... <laughs> <laughs> I just... That is so rude. <laughs> and I hate that oh you God. laugh so <laughs> hard at your own joke. No, it wasn't my joke. It was I looked at the famous redheads, and I was about to go with Molly Ringwald. And I was like, oh, that's a good one. Then I clicked one more, and it was Elmo. And it happened the second you stopped reading the letter. The fact that the chip area is worn out... Con con confused and confirmed. Did you have that picture is anybody on a drive? Remember oh, there we go. No! <laughs> Thank you, Ginger Spice. It was supposed to be brawned.